right, welcome to episode one of DEC Does What, Woo! our first inaugural podcast. I can't believe we're here. I can't either. So I'm your host, Sean Mahar. I'm the Executive Deputy Commissioner for uh, Team DEC here, and I'm joined by... Erica Ringwald. I am the Chief of Staff here at DEC. So we are two of the leaders of this amazing agency who regularly find ourselves saying DEC does what? Because there's a lot. And even after a full decade of state service now, we still find ourselves asking that question regularly. So we wanted to start a podcast to really explore some of those things that make this agency awesome. But Erica, why did we really start this podcast? So DEC, I feel like there are so many stories that we don't get out the door. You know, we have a great social media presence. We have press releases, multiple press releases that go out every day. We have a massive and fantastic website. Check it out, dec.ny.gov. But we don't reach everybody, and we wanted to look for more opportunities to get our stories out there. So on the show, we're going to cover uh, some of the recent news items that caught our eye and then go in-depth with some of the experts on the topics that you want to hear about on this show. So Erica, what are some of the things that caught your eye in the news in the past few weeks? So a couple of things that are top of mind for me. Uh, One, we recently closed out a public comment period on a draft regulation. So bear with me. This gets a little processy. Uh, DEC is proposing to reduce the amount of hydrofluorocarbons that get into the atmosphere. Uh, Hydrofluorocarbons, also known as HFCs, are a really potent greenhouse gas that contributes to climate change. And in order for New York to meet our goals to reduce climate pollution, we got to get rid of HFCs. So these gases are in a lot of refrigeration and cooling equipment. Um, And DEC put together some draft regs that went out from public comment. And let me tell you, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Indeed there is, Erica. I think we need to educate some of our uh, New Yorkers here on what these regs actually are and will not do. So is DEC proposing to take your refrigerator? We are not coming for your fridge. Uh, What we are doing, if your fridge needs repair, go ahead and repair it. This is not going to make any difference. But what we're really trying to do is get those big chain grocery stores, the big ones, to switch over. Is that immediate? It is not. Um, Stores would be able to maintain their equipment as long as it's useful life. So repairs, absolutely. Full replacement then you need to start looking at some of these more natural alternatives, which are out there. There are stores that have already made the switch. Walgreens stores, Aldi stores, and other stores across the country. Those two examples are right here in New York. So we appreciate everyone providing their comments on this important regulation. And and one thing that DEC is great about is process. And there is some more process to play. And we'll be sure to come back with you to with updates on where we're headed with this important regulation and uh, really all the work that we're doing to fight against climate change here in New York. This just being one small part of that. Yep. Uh, but check out our website. As Erica said, we've got a lot of information up there on HFCs and, and what these things are, why they're so important uh, to address in climate change, and, and why we need to get them out of our products. So Erica, it's uh, almost summertime here in New York, and one of the cool things uh, DEC has to offer is at summer camps. And we are in the process now of staffing up for our summer camps, and we're looking for camp counselors. Is that right? That is right, Sean. DEC operates a few summer camps, and we are looking for staff. From counselors to cooks and nurses, we need staff in order to operate our summer camps safely and responsibly. And I know that, you know, the the challenge of finding staff to help operate summer camps is not unique to DEC. This is a problem across the board. Um, But I would encourage folks looking for a summer job, check it out because you get to spend your summer outside doing fun stuff in nature. So visit our website, dec.ny.gov, and I will say that a million times, (laughs) to learn more about opportunities to work at DEC summer camps. It really is an awesome opportunity to, as you said, spend time outside, but also start getting real-world job experience and get into the state retirement system. And we'll hear later on in the show today with one of our guests who has a special DEC summer camp experience that he shares with us on this show. Awesome. But before we do that, um, one of the other things on mind is it's fire season here in New York, Erica, right? it is. Uh, And because it's fire season, spring is fire season, we uh, announced the annual burn ban. Um, It is from March 16th through May 14th. 
DEC has had the burn ban in place for more than a decade now. I believe it's since 2009. Uh, it has reduced the number of spring wildfires by nearly, I believe, 40 percent, which is pretty significant because most most forest fires are human uh, caused, caused by people. And the burn ban has reduced that by limiting where people can burn brush. Yeah, a lot of people think of, you know, wildfires being a Western states issue or Canada issue, as we learned last summer. But New York is a, a fire dependent state and we have uh, many unique ecosystems like the Albany pine bush and the uh, pine barrens on Long Island that are dependent upon fire. And we do prescribe fires and careful management. But what we're trying to do is reduce fire risk overall. And the biggest way people can do that is obviously following the burn ban. So thank you for that important reminder. You know, transitioning now from uh, our climatological efforts, we have a major celestial event coming up, which is a total solar eclipse in New York State. And today we're happy to be joined by Dr. Angie Ross and Dr. Dan Rosenblatt from our Division of Fish and Wildlife, who are going to walk us through a little bit of how wildlife respond to an eclipse and what to expect coming up. DEC encourages visitors to put safety first, including yourself, loved ones, and others while traveling and viewing the eclipse. DEC Environmental Conservation Police Officers, Forest Rangers, Emergency Management, and Operation Staff continue to monitor weather conditions and will be prepared for visitors. Eclipse watchers are encouraged to find Adirondack destinations outside the backcountry or opt for visiting one of the many designated viewing locations across the state. To learn more about how to stay safe while experiencing the eclipse, visit dec.ny.gov. Obviously, we have some cool things on the horizon coming up in New York State, but one of the coolest things is this upcoming eclipse. This is a very historic opportunity that's happening uh, all across the majority of upstate New York. Pretty much all of New York will see some of the eclipse, but the true path of totality is in upstate New York. And we've been getting a lot of questions here from um, listeners and, and just frequent contributors to Team DEC about the wildlife health impacts of an eclipse and how wildlife adapt in an eclipse. And we're happy to be joined today by Dr. Angie Ross and Dr. Dan Rosenblatt from our Division of Fish and Wildlife here, who are going to give us a walkthrough of how wildlife species adapt to a, an eclipse. So Angie, Dan, welcome to DEC Does What? Thank you so much. Thanks, Sean. Nice to be here. So I know there's some concerns, and we've been doing some tabletop exercises here in the state, really planning our emergency response aspects of this and making sure that the potential hundreds of thousands of people who will be coming to New York for this awesome celestial event uh, have a great experience. But one of the things we've heard of is concerns about, you know, what happens to the species and, you know, is it going to be like Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds here and all of a sudden our wildlife are going to go crazy in an eclipse? But what do you think? Well, um, I I was actually in I I I almost said participated in, but I I traveled down to Nashville in 2017 in August for a solar eclipse, and I was very excited about what might be happening there, and I was tuned into all the bird sounds and the you know the singing insects at the you know at that time, and uh, so it was just as you know you read in the books. The birds stopped singing and the the crickets started, you know, cricketing or whatever sounds they make, <laughs> whatever. And uh, I mean, it was such a brief event. It was only two and a half minutes, I think, where I was. But uh, it, it was just like clockwork, just as described. And obviously we expect something similar here in New York. But, you know, this is a short duration event, right? So we don't anticipate really anything out of the ordinary happening. And Species are adapted well to, you know, daylight and nighttime. And when you get a, a little blip in that, nothing bad happens, right? Sure. And part of what Angie uh, mentioned there really depends on the time of year that the eclipse happens as well um, and the time of day. Um, one of the things that uh, you're not going to see probably as dramatically this time because it's in early April and the eclipse is towards the uh, later afternoon, um, you might not have that many birds calling before the eclipse. Um, so the the change might not be as dramatic. Yeah, that's true. And it, it's April eighth, so I wonder if uh, I wonder if frogs might have some frog calling going on because the crickets out. are 
or I'm sorry, crickets. The uh, the spring peepers are calling, so that could be kind of exciting. That was going to be one of my questions, actually, too. With migrations underway, obviously the bird migration just starting, but amphibian migration right now is very much you know underway. Um, do you expect more frogs and salamanders to potentially cross the road during the short period of time, or maybe just hear them call and then they'll quiet down after the sun comes back up? I guess it depends if it's raining, which would <laughs> kind of stink for uh, for observing the eclipse, I think. But uh, we do hope this podcast doesn't jinx you. So <laughs> yeah. listeners, we apologize in advance if it does. Yeah. So so yeah. I mean, if it's raining, I guess that could. I mean, it is so short. Yeah, so uh, generally the, the species that are most likely to respond to the eclipse are species that are essentially out in the open already. Um, so like your mole salamanders that generally spend the day underground are unlikely to even really notice that it's gotten dark to be able to respond. Unless, like Angie said, if it's raining, if it's overcast and it gets really dark, then yeah, they might come out earlier. Sure. But like you know, the frogs that are already at the pond, they're essentially already in breeding mode. As soon as you know the lights go down, they're ready to do their thing. So I was thinking about that we're kind of seeing the signs of early spring and so the amphibians are out. And one of my concerns, honestly, is that there are going to be more critters on the road with all this traffic because of the eclipse. So I guess we are seeing an earlier spring this year by a couple of weeks now. That could all change this week because we know New York weather, right? But what are some of the effects that we're seeing on wildlife that are happening because of our changing climate? That's actually a really good question. Um, and you know, for a lot of species, there there isn't a clear answer yet. Um, there's still a lot of concern as to um, whether certain species like Bicknell's thrush, which lives on um, you know, in the high peaks here in New York, um, those species that live in rare habitats, particularly those habitats that uh, require cooler climates, um, whether those will be able to persist long term in New York. Um, for other species, um, yeah, black vulture is a good example of a species that uh, you know 30 years ago didn't occur in New York, uh, first showed up around 2000, and since then has done an excellent job of making itself a local pest, um, and is uh, now basically up to uh, the Mohawk Valley. Um, so some species will take advantage of those sort of changes in climate that occur. And there's other species that uh, won't be able to be um, as fortunate, at least within New York State. The birds actually have an advantage. Obviously, um, they can move around. They're pretty mobile. They can track some of those changes. Um, so um, comparatively speaking, uh, the smaller animals, um, the, the amphibians, for example, a lot of uh, the flightless invertebrates, they don't have the luxury of being able to really get up and move and track those kinds of uh, wholesale sort of landscape level changes. Um, so, you know, again, it's going to kind of depend on the individual species and the types of habitats that they're accustomed to. But one of the things that um, I like to point out to folks, um, the, my, my reason for optimism, and as Angie can attest, I'm not known for them, um, but the, when it comes to wildlife, um, I am optimistic from the standpoint that relatively recent time, as far as, uh, you know, from geological terms go, um, all of New York was a different habitat 10,000 years ago. Um, that's not that long of a time period if you're talking about the evolutionary history of species. And pretty much everything that's in New York today wasn't here 10,000 years ago. So, you know, with that in mind, we know that species can adapt to new habitats, can take advantage of new opportunities and come in and, um, you know, do their thing where they have the opportunity to do so. Concern with climate change is really the fact that it's the pace how quickly those changes occur. We talked earlier about the eclipse, something that happens over the course of three minutes every 20 to 100 years at any particular location really doesn't have much of an effect on anything. There's really no way for species to adapt to something that occurs so infrequently. But a lot of the species in North America have evolved to essentially, you know, they, they, they were here through the ice ages. They've had that landscape come and go. The species that have been around for the last 10,000 years have at least had the time to start to become accustomed to humans in various forms and the various impacts that we have on the landscape. And you know, while we've lost some species, and there are certainly a lot of concerns for a lot of um, animals and the habitats that are out there, um, we know that there's a lot of potential within these species to respond to change. They've done it before. So It is pretty optimistic, Dan. So I worked with spruce grouse, I mentioned, and they're a resident 
year-round resident in New York, and they don't really have anywhere to, to go. They're not good flyers. They don't migrate. Lowland boreal forests are gone, as eventually will probably happen with climate change. There's not really going to be a place for spruce grouse and some of those other lowland boreal species to go. But then there's the the issue of species decoupling too, you know. So the the decoupling is a, a is a real thing, and part of that is because of essentially the different ways in which uh, various species actually interact with time, with the perception of time, how they interact with um, the natural world, and, um, and and time various behaviors. It would be fantastic if everything used the sun. And, uh, you know, we would be able to tell you exactly how everything responds to the eclipse because they would respond to it the same way. They don't. Um, you have animals that react and uh, exhibit certain behaviors based on how long the day is. So that's the that's probably the closest we have to essentially the, the sun watchers. Um, but you have a whole suite of other species that respond to things like temperature. We, we were just talking earlier about amphibians and amphibians. It's sort of this this complex combination of both temperature and precipitation. It has to be incredibly humid or raining uh, for a lot of amphibians to be active, but it also has to be above freezing. And you know, getting back to what you were saying before, from you know that that uh, sort of that 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 long term view of how long these various behaviors and uh, traits of these various species um, have evolved that there's that concern if there's a rapid change as far as like when those temperatures occur on the landscape and if the amphibians are coming out earlier but a lot of the invertebrates that they depend on are operating on a different uh, sort of uh, biological clock if you will um, that if those insects aren't there when they go to um, do their thing in the, the breeding ponds they might be able to lay their eggs but if the adults can't feed they're essentially going to have they're literally putting all their eggs in one basket. And if those young can't be successful that next season, you can actually lose a local population very quickly. Yeah. And, you know, that's essentially, you know, that 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 dangerous road that we start going down um, where you might actually start losing species in various places on the landscape. Very true. Yes. Amphibians have a little trick up their sleeve too, though. So as uh, egg mouses, I, you know, <laughs> I'm switching it back up. <laughs> So um, in, in like a vernal pool where there could be an egg mass, amphibian egg mass, um, as the, um, the food availability goes down, that forces them to metamorphose quick, you know, more quickly and then get the heck out of there and find some food somewhere else. So that's... Oh, and, and nature's even more brutal than that. With the, the tiger salamanders down on Long Island, the tiger salamanders themselves have an adaptation that if only their larvae are present, some of those larvae will essentially evolve teeth. They'll, they'll actually grow teeth and uh, they become cannibalistic and That's they'll eat so the cool. smaller larvae so that some will survive. They're all related, so there is actually an evolutionary reason why that actually makes sense. Thanks, Dr. Dan. We really wanted to end on a high note. <laughs> For sure, but science is fascinating. <laughs> um, wow. So awesome news. And it's great to learn. And this is why, you know, DEC is such an awesome place to work because you get awesome individuals like the two of you who know so much stuff out there about the work that you do. And obviously, you know, the risks of climate change are, are great. And we've got, you know, our Office of Climate Change, our Division of Air Resources really working on the mitigation side. But we have to work on adaptation. So you've talked about some of the risks and threats, but what are some of the things that, you know, we're doing in Fish and Wildlife to really help our species adapt in climate change? It's not fish and wildlife per se, but it's really the statewide effort to try to secure habitat for these species long term. Um, you know, the last 30 years in New York, the, um, the pace at which uh, land acquisition and land protection has been proceeding um, with the departments, uh, other state agencies, our NGO partners, um, that's probably the most important step that can be done. And, uh, you know, with the Bond Act out there, um, there's a lot of efforts um, and, and, and optimism that that action of uh, securing land and securing habitat is going to continue um, going forward. That being said, as you know, Angie had uh, pointed out, there are certain species uh, that aren't necessarily going to be able to move into those habitats if they're in a place where um, they're not going to be able to uh, be sustained because of those climate changes. And those things are a little bit harder for folks to address. Um, there are some uh, programs in place, Division of Fish and Wildlife, along with Division of Lands and Forests. Uh, the Trees for Tribs program is a really good example of a proactive sort of classic uh, conservation action that helps 
prevent sedimentation into our streams, you basically plant trees uh, all along the banks of your stream. Your trees provide shading, and that shading prevents sunlight getting down into the water, which helps prevent rapid warming of uh, the water during the summer. There's a lot of species that require colder temperatures, and we were talking about triggers for certain activities, and temperature really is one. Um, there's a whole suite of uh, fish species that won't actually spawn unless the temperature is below a certain level. And um, you know, just by um, something as, I'll say, simple, I mean, the idea is simple. It's awful hard to plant millions of trees, but uh, planting- But we will be, Dan, in New York State. 25 million to be. That uh, you know, the strategic planting of trees can help you know not only improve water quality by preventing sedimentation, but it can help kind of provide these sort of micro we call them climate refugia, where these little cold pockets um, you know in habitats can hopefully persist. We don't know for sure, and it depends again. You know, ultimately, that's the, the elephant in the room is really the pace of climate change. But anything that we can do to essentially create those those pockets where um, different species have the ability to have some time um, to potentially adapt to the changing environment around them. Um, you know, we're giving them as good a chance as possible on their own. And it also gives us time um, and the research community time to come up with other potential solutions. Dan and Angie, you know, part of what we do on the show, and welcome to our inaugural show, and thanks for being our first official guests here on DEC Does What. Happy to have you both. We also want to take a, a look at the people behind what makes this agency awesome. And clearly, you're two super smart people in our division of Fish and Wildlife. But why don't you tell our listeners just a little bit more about what brought you to Team DEC and what you do here for the state? So I, I mean, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, I was, I mean, I did back in the day. I wanted to, to teach music. So, so that was my major. I went to SUNY Potsdam, the Crane School of Music, great school. And I took some biology classes and then learned that adults do work with wildlife while I was in biology class. And that kind of blew my mind. So, you know, I mean, there was a circuitous route to get to that point. But once I learned that, everything clicked. And I, um, you know, I was in grad school and I, I took one of the exams. It was the biologist exam, just, you know, because why limit myself? I didn't really know what I wanted to do um, with that, you know, with the degree totally. And, uh, and it was just, it just kind of happened. So I got an interview a couple of years later and then it was like two weeks after that, I was working at DEC. What I love about our agency is that this is where the rubber hits the road. You know, this is where I feel like I have the most impact. Yeah, so I, I started working with spruce grouse as an undergrad, an endangered bird in New York State, and um, did a little bit of turtle work, some Blanding's turtle work while I was up there in St. Lawrence County as well. And uh, now I'm here trying to expand um, my brain into thinking about other species as well. And it's been great so far. Awesome. And Dan, take us on your journey. Yeah. So uh, mine's a little bit different than Angie's. Um, I kind of felt like this is, well, I didn't know exactly where I was heading all along, but uh, it, it was here. Um, I basically grew up with a fascination of all things that um, in the natural world, um, both um, you know, fish and wildlife, uh, had an intense interest in astronomy as well. Those Interests competed until I was about 12 years old. Uh, after years of uh, petitioning my parents to go to Ranger Rick summer camp, um, my dad brought home a flyer for DEC summer camp. They could afford to send me to Camp Rushford. And I went to Camp Rushford for three years. That's where I learned that uh, there actually was an entity out there that actually had the same values that I had as a um, young adolescent. Um, witnessing my favorite places uh, in my suburban New Jersey home disappearing on an annual basis as it, you know, there goes another mini mall, there goes a new housing complex, and, uh, you know, where's the wildlife going? The symbol, the old uh, symbol for DEC, um, being along the boundary of uh, uh, the uh, Hanging Bog Wildlife Management Area, learning what that actually meant and what those uh, habitats actually were for, finding out that they were actually for wildlife and providing habitat, setting aside habitat for species. It's like, there's an organization that actually does that. That's where, that's who I got to work for. And uh, the rest of my um, schooling went in that direction. 
I uh, did my undergrad at Rutgers in biology, got to do an undergrad thesis working in the Arthur Kill on um, cattle egrets and killifish. And from there, I went to grad school actually in Illinois, but um, uh, always with an eye of coming back to New York. Similar to Angie, took the biology exam while I was in grad school. Um, literally, as I was graduating, I got the phone call for an endangered species biologist uh, opening on Long Island. and wasn't a hard decision. So listeners, you've heard uh, uh, Dan and Angie talk about their journeys. They've mentioned testing. And just so you know, I mean, New York is a civil service state. We have civil service tests that you can take and apply and, and uh, be open for positions that way. I think, Dan, to hear from you, you know, sort of your astronomical interests are now, you know, coming full circle with an eclipse coming up. But Angie, too, I mean, hearing about your uh, sort of pathway and, you know, your interest in music, I'll just say when people ask me personally, like, you know, what's my favorite song or band or group? Sometimes the nerd in me is always like the spring morning chorus because there is nothing better than the sounds of nature, honestly, and nature's true musicians when you think about the musical qualities of birds in, in general. And it's just so cool to be outside and someone you can see and experience. It's super, super cool. I totally agree. Stuff, but that's why we have important people like you helping us make sure that we're protecting those habitats and keeping those birds along. And, and obviously, with our fight on climate change, you know, birds are some of the early indicators of what we're seeing happening with climate change. As you know, ranges are shifting more northward, and obviously, short-term events like an eclipse don't really have a big impact. But the daily things that we do in our backyard do have a big impact. And what are some of the things that you would want our listeners here today to, you know, leave with? And what the, what can they do in their backyard to help our wildlife species out? I would say anything that you can do um, to be supportive of natural habitats using natural um, uh, lawn managements, if you need to have a lawn at all, um, you know, just be mindful of the fact that um, you know, when, whenever you put something out into the environment, um, you know, wherever the water goes, the, that's where those chemicals go. So even if you're um, trying to uh, address an issue that seems local, um, those, uh, how we react to those kinds of issues really can have, you know, literally downstream effects. And, you know, from a, from a bigger picture perspective, be aware of environmental issues and how folks are going about addressing them, because that, that's the other side of climate change isn't, you know, there's, there's, there's the issue that we were talking about today, which is really how animals are responding to differences in, um, precipitation or temperature, but, the real driver of what happens to the natural world is going to be based on how humans respond to climate change. And the more we kind of go for the big scale, um, you know, technical solution, building solution, um, the fewer options there's going to be available for, um, uh, for the natural options. So exploring things like the use of uh, revegetating tidal wetlands to mitigate storm surge as opposed to building um, seawalls and uh, uh, hard structures that provides both habitat for the species that are losing it the fastest and ultimately provides a more sustainable solution that doesn't wind up tying our hands in the future and reducing our options um, down the line. So when that if, if that seawall fails someday, you can't get those marshes back. So just just to be aware of the bigger picture. Definitely. We've got a lot of folks here at Team DEC that are working on those issues and, you know, collaborating directly with you all. So great messages for our team. I wanted to, to also mention, if you have some dead and down trees in your backyard or, you know, out in your back 40, you know, don't don't burn those. Leave those for the amphibians and uh, reptiles, you know, to use as hidey spots. Um, now that spring is upon us, uh, maybe you know, think twice about like feeding birds at this time, especially especially if you're in bear country. Feeding your animals inside, don't leave food outside because we deal with quite a quite a bit of bear issues this time of year. So, well, Angie, thank you for that, and my wife does not thank you because I am a <laughs> big proponent of leaving all the yard clippings and things on the yard, especially this time of year. It's good, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so, yeah. she doesn't want me to do that though. So. Just push it back a little, but but don't burn it or, you know, throw it away, you know. Yeah, <laughs> compost is always good, too. So thanks, guys. That was an amazing journey on the path to totality. I'm looking forward to it. Me, too. It's going to be awesome. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Episode one. Pretty exciting. Can't believe it. I know. 
So awesome. And importantly, we want to hear from you. Let us know how the show was, but also let us know what you want us to cover in the future. Please uh, reach out to us through contact at dec.ny.gov. That's contact at dec.ny.gov. Put podcast in your subject line and let us know what you want to hear about. And stay tuned next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening and get outside. DEC Does What? is a production of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. Executive producer is Maureen Wren. Theme music is by Mike Menza. Like what you heard on this episode? Please leave a review or share this with others. Want to learn more about DEC's wide-ranging efforts to protect New Yorkers and the environment? Visit dec.ny.gov or connect with us on social media. Find us using at NYSDEC. For more information on DEC Does What? Visit dec.ny.gov slash podcast.